Welcome, uh, great to be here. Um, we're gonna talk about you. We're gonna try to give you guys a uh, 20 years perspective because this is 20 years uh, anniversary for Nordic Game, which is just amazing. And I just wanna, you know, for my own uh, celebrate uh, the Nordic Games. Uh, it's been such a fantastic show in terms of connecting people, helping our game industry business here to grow, uh, helping us all to deliver amazing products to the world. And, uh, and now, if you look back at where we were, 2004 to now, we have so many amazing uh, games out there, worldwide recognized games. And um, this, I believe strongly uh, in my heart that uh, Nordic Game is part of having helped to to make sure this could happen in the Nordic region. So I'm very grateful and very honored to be able to run this uh, panel here with these lovely people. So I'm gonna give you a quick, quick, quick introduction to them. I'm gonna then do a quick uh, um, uh, kind of looking back at uh, 2004 to give you some perspective, uh, some memories. Anyone who wasn't in here who wasn't born in 2004? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. No, good, good, good. Kay. No. Um, they just wonder, like, who are these old people? I'm not going to go to that panel, <laughs> uh, probably. Okay, uh, let's go for it. So, we have Christine with us here today. She, uh, her first game, yeah, applaud, of course, uh, was Hitman uh, Blood Money uh, in 2006. Uh, she basically started outsourcing games uh, from IO Interactive before we knew, uh, the rest of the industry knew what that world was. She started uh, in b already back in 95 with uh, animations and TV, and she's probably most known for uh, Troll Tales, um, right? Yeah. And then we have Hilary. Uh, there's not much to say <laughs> except that he started as CEO in 1995. That is a respect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, celebrating 30 years then next year. Yes, amazing. indeed. Yeah, uh, I think we can make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, uh, least but not lastly, we have uh, Morten here. Uh, if you can't spot him here on this picture, <laughs> I can zoom in a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Morten says. Uh, he played his first game in 76, is that true? That is true. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore, man. That's hardcore. Yeah. yeah. Thug I, I think Thug I've played life, games man. every day, actually, <laughs> since 1976. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, an amazing <laughs> career at, uh, at Funcom and uh, uh, first video game <laughs> conference E3 96. That's, that's impressive. That's when I got started. So to give you uh, a perspective on where were we at 2004, uh, these are some of the games that were released that year. Uh, Flat Out from, from Finland, for example, just want to uh, point out that specifically. Uh, everyone remembers uh, SingStar, of course, Half-Life 2, uh, and uh, the Nintendo DS uh, released this year. And it's, uh, some of these games are still you know, very, very dear to my heart as well. I hope they are to yours as well. I looked up, like, where were we at, like, industry-wise, and, and uh, a, a little bit, uh, you know, just look at Sweden here, uh, the Swedish de Computer Developer um, uh, Association got started uh, just before 2004. So this is the difference in terms of uh, employees. 71 employees in the game industry in Sweden in 2004, 900, oh sorry, companies, <laughs> 71, employees, 715. And uh, we've grown quite a bit, right? Closing in on 8,500 in 2023, which is absolutely amazing. We've also managed to increase the, the percentage of women, which I think is very positive. Some, some more games from, from 2003 and four there in the report. What was the business climate then? Well, this is a, a, a screenshot of how Steam looked back then, right? Uh, they had it for, for uh, Counter-Strike, and then in, uh, 
in the fall, I think it was November 2004, uh, Half-Life 2 released. Um, if you were in the business then, right, there was no option of self-publishing, right? Your only option really was to go with a publisher. Uh, there was only physical distribution. Um, uh, I think digital distribution, uh, thanks to Steam, uh, really opened amazing doors for us, but it hadn't really happened in 2004. Uh, when we made deals then, uh, most of the deals were recoup against royalty, meaning that the developers uh, um, had to recoup the, the investment that was made into them from their royalty share, which might be 10, 15, 20 percent or so. It took forever. Basically, nobody got royalties. Uh, publishers took all the IPs such a different world today, right? When we have everything from, from VC investment to self-publishing to you know, all a plethora of, of uh, options, really. Just amazing. Um, remember that a physical game was on the shelf for uh, just a certain time, right? And then the price was lowered to clear the shelves for other things. So the long tail we have today as well is just amazing. And of course, uh, here's a just to give some perspective of the number of games that started the releasing yearly since then. It's pretty amazing. Consoles then, how did that look? Well, uh, who, who in the audience here did some console work uh, 2004 or earlier? Uh, raise your hand, please. Oh, there's a couple, yeah. <laughs> good, good. That's all. Um, I, I had the pleasure of uh, producing a game called Rally Sport Challenge for the original Xbox. Uh, that released with, with the European launch. Um, it was uh, not easy. It got better when we finally got uh, hardware that, that worked uh, in the couple of months before releasing. Um, and remember those days where it was just like, you don't patch a game, right? You ship this, this disc it, it, is it. Uh, you know, if something is wrong, it's wrong, right? Uh, scary, scary times. And just look at the specs, right? Uh, PlayStation 2, 32 megabytes, and then the, the 4 megabyte uh, video RAM, uh, just nuts. The Xbox looks luxurious with 64. Uh, compared to today, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, it's nuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, GPU, I didn't get the numbers uh, for the PlayStation 2, but, but check the Xbox. It, the Xbox was in Gigaflux 4.66, and now it's 12. Uh, 12, a little bit more than 12 teraflops. It's, it's nuts. What did we do with this? Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of a frame of where we were at. Um, in 2004, uh, introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Tobias. I've been here, I think, ev every year there's, there's been. <laughs> Couldn't find an older picture than 2009 or something like that. Eight? Oh, I don't know. I um, had the luxury of working with the exec uh, event here many years, and uh, I was actually the, the um, if I remember this correctly, I was the opening speaker on the very first uh, Nordic game ever, uh, which was just uh, uh, an amazing experience. So, uh, back to our uh, panelists here. Um, <laughs> uh, there we go. So, uh, I'll start the first kind of uh, question and, and, uh, and join you uh, in your seats there uh, <laughs> with where were you? Uh, what were you doing in 2004? So, Ilari, will you start? Okay, okay, 2004. It took a while to remember that, but the 2004, we were fledging startup on our ninth year. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm, maybe it's kind of, we were a pretty old company by then. So it was a pretty tough year, actually, by that time. So still managing director of Housemark, we're pitching games, try, try, to, try to survive. Um, we had a previous year, we had launched our first console game, Transfer Snowboarding on our original Xbox. And we were supposed to have a sequel. A sequel was in our back. And we were like, yes, this, this is the biggest deal we ever done. And then, of course, late 2003, that didn't materialize. So we had to, you know, figure something out. Actually, that's the one lesson that you still should do business development, even though you th think that you have a sure thing in your back pocket. So anything can happen. True it does involve was kind of a survival fight. And, uh, you know, we were, we were working on actually a PlayStation 2 engine. We, we, we made, a, made a kind of a big demo of a PlayStation 2 game, which never became reality. But, but and we ended up doing smaller, smaller gigs, um, but you know, it, is, it wasn't the kind of the best of the years. I have to say, I think that was the year. Might have been the year that we didn't 
pay ourselves we, the co-founders didn't pay ourselves and that sort of thing so not the, the, not the best of times <laughs> not awesome yeah yeah but what do you remember from from the nordic game conference then because i think you were here at i think actually i have a conference i think i wasn't here oh <laughs> yes <laughs> nobody invited me uh, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I think I think I look at my actually I have my emails and look at look at my emails. I think the first first one might be Nordic thing might be uh, GDC 2006 okay. when there was a Nordic. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and okay. then of course since then I've been I've been here like 15 years yeah. out of these 20. So so it's been the best show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And Christine, where where were you at in 2004? Yeah, like you said, I came from the animation industry, so I was working for Egmont, a uh, large publishing house in, in the Nordics. Um, and Egmont at that time also had invested and owned, partly owned, IO Interactive. So the guys from IO Interactive, uh, the, the managing director um, and co-founder, Janos and I, we were always put in the same batch, in the same... Whenever Nordic Film, which is part of Egmont, held their big leadership seminars and stuff, Janus and I was put together because we were the weird ones. He was doing games and I was doing animation. And so we became friends. And one day he said, can't you come and show us what it is you do for, for animation? Because it might be smart. And so I actually joined IO Interactive in 2004 when they were bought by Eidos. Oh, yeah. And uh, and started my career in games. So this is my 20 years anniversary in games as well. Thank you Sweet. for reminding yeah. me of that. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And Morten, what did you do? In 2004, I did what my father had always told me that I should do and try to get a proper job. <laughs> so in 2000, I co-founded a games portal um, that built web-based games and had almost half a million gamers on the portal. But it was a bit too late for getting the, the dot-com investments that we thought we were going to get. So that had been kind of four years of fighting to get investment. And in late 2003, we managed to sell the portal to an edutainment company for almost enough cash to pay the Norwegian taxes <laughs> on the paper millions we never saw. <laughs> Nice. So, so then kind of I, I accepted a, an offer from a recruiter who said, okay, but we have a solid company for you to go to. Um, and then I joined UP, UPC to help build and launch games on their setup boxes and game services. Because we just had our first child and I needed something a little bit more stable than the crazy startups in the game side. And before the dot-com startup, I had done publishing and distribution of games in the Nordics for... 10 years. So in 2004, I celebrated my 50th year anniversary. So this year is my 35th. <gasps> oh, so awesome. But it only lasted a few years, even though we did a fantastic session with all the UPC management teams from the all over Europe. I showed them games on an internet cafe. We launched Battlefield 1942. I had them play. They all thought it was fantastic at the yeah. time. Those sweet Pulled me aside yeah. afterwards and said, that's what we want on our set of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> a bit <Yeah>. too complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, I remember a guy, um, uh, as I worked at DICE then, uh, at E3, uh, the year after we released Battlefield 942, um, uh, Ted from Aspire, he said, we can port it to Mac. Let me show you. So he had a Mac laptop there and Battlefield running. I was like, how the hell did you do that? Because he didn't have access to source code or anything. It's like, how did you get it running on a Mac? And he's like, oh, it's actually Linux running on the Mac. <laughs> uh, but like, that's trickier to make it work on a Mac. And uh, yeah, yeah. And they got the source code and somehow <laughs> made that work. I don't know, very strange. Um, cool. Um, around that time then, uh, 20 years ago, uh, about, what, what was, uh, you know, tell us how it was in the office. What was, uh, what was, what was happening? What was going on? Well, we, as mentioned, we were kind of uh, working on PS2 technology. We built our own engine back then. I interesting tidbit of information, the, these uh, PlayStation 2 console development devices they were really big boxes like, like this. They were, they were giant-sized PlayStation 2s. And in order to get that, you need to pay 20,000 euros for it. Yeah. So that was a big investment. Now they're almost like free. So, so we were working working on that. Of course, we were downsizing because you know we didn't get the deal, and 
it was a bit tough, but of course we luckily had money to money to uh, you know go to E3s of this world. So so we, we're still kind of were alive. We got some some other gigs. I think uh, I think it was time when Engage launched 2004. Now I'm not, not quite sure, but at least they, we had some some gig there with, with with that as well. That kind of kept us going. So we did the, one of the first games that was embedded with the in the memory cards that was embedded with the Engage. So that was kind of snowboarding snowboarding game. So did some gigs to survive uh and uh and uh, that was you know lucky lucky thing lucky thing to have that is true the uh i think even the engage came out the year before um, yes uh, but and it was, was kind of a, a, actually a, there was there was kind of boom of extreme sports yeah. there was like kite surfing and bmx riding and like skateboarding you know it all started with tony Tony Hawk's like a few years earlier, and then it's mushroomed, and it's they, they kind of kind of realized that well, not ma many many people is interested in surfing, for instance. There was transfer snow surfing as well mm. uh, within that we were working working with Atari, so transfer snowboarding, transfer a big brand, you know, this extreme sports brand, and we got our game attached a year year before. But it was kind of a, it burst the bubble of the extreme sports as well, and I think the only only ones. You know, after after that, very few surfing games or BMX games have been released. They've been they've been skating games and some snowboarding games, but that has survived once yeah. in a while. But they ha there's no annual you know releases of these games. So so we were deemed to be kind of a pigeonholed in this extreme sports bucket, and, and that's why we started. To actually, I think that's why we started to do so many different games the next 10 years that nobody could say that, hey, you can't do this or you can't do that, mm -hmm. because we did so many different things. Yeah, that is true. And uh, I think uh, you also touch on, on how important uh, Nokia and Engage were for the whole, uh, you know, Sorry? Uh, yeah. how important Nokia and Engage were yeah, for the whole yeah. industry in, in Finland. Sure, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we kind of had, had luck, luck to, to be there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, one, one, it's so weird that this is one of the deals that kind of made, kept us running and mm. and uh, and so so there were other other weird things we we did uh, this palm based uh zodiac i think it was called we did we did that and and then there was this other one top uh, what was that what was the way the swedish gangsters were running oh what yeah uh that device uh, yeah <laughs> exactly yeah so uh, we were doing these kind of uh Things there was this palm based thing and that mm. that that thing and forgot uh, the name of yeah. it. Yeah, I forgot myself as well. Yeah. Gizmondo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so audience is helping us. <laughs> yes. No, no, yeah, uh, palm pilot was that, but that the Swedish Swedish kind the of uh, Gizmondo. Gizmondo, yeah, yeah, Gizmondo, Gizmondo yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was good. I remember going to GDC and seeing presentations about mobile games, right, where they had like they put the phone in under some sort of. Uh, uh, device that put it up on the screen so you could see what they were playing and <laughs> here's this Java game and here's this Java game right and uh, and Nokia were doing big shows there and then I think it was the maybe the last year in San Jose uh, and and Engage had failed right it was like oh, removing it from the market it didn't work out and uh, this can't remember the name of it but there was a guy from Nokia did an amazingly great speech like post-mortem wrapped it up and in the end, he was just like, well, we didn't succeed, but at least we pushed the envelope. Um, and I, I wonder if he, he see today what that actually made for the Finnish gaming industry in terms of digital chocolate and everything that followed, that he must be really, really proud because <laughs> it, it was the foundation for, for a lot of that, right? You engage me, mean, or? Yeah, so so I think I, I'd be a bit of disagree, actually, that, that yep. Engage would have been that, that important. I think the mo most important thing that we started to have some VC funding in okay. 2000. And you got the Sulak, one of the first companies who did this, these uh, microtransactions, yeah. you know. Hubba Hotel. That Hubba Hotel, mm -hmm. and, and you started to have this Ilka Panasens for first uh, mobile studio, digital chocolate, and that mm -hmm. sort of a thing that became they started Supercell a few years later. So there was, there was kind of some funding that wasn't available, of course, for, for, for this old school PC console developers. True, true. But I think that was more important. Of course, mm. it saved many companies in an indirect way, like us. In yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. so, so there were other companies did a nice gigs, mm -hmm. gigs with, with Nokia. So, so there's kind of, I, I kind of think that the funding, the, you know, the first VC funding, late 90s, that kind of became the 
key 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 to further success of, of Finnish game industry. And uh, we were envious of. I was watching the f Swedish things that you you could have a you could go to a over the counter stock exchange and like raise money <laughs> even there back then in the late late nineties, right? So yep. so in the dice I think did that and. Uh, Many others, massive, and there were other companies who did that. So, Starbreeze, uh, yeah, but we didn't have that option. Yeah. yeah, true. So, Christine takes us to, I mean, you started traveling to China uh, about this point, right? In time, yeah, well, I had traveled to China before yeah, for course. my previous job, but and I started in in IO in for IO Interactive a bit later, actually. I when I joined IO uh, in 2004, they had just released Hitman Contract. And um, and they had just got in in well bought by uh, I think they were called SCI Games before mm. it was then bought by Eidos and so we would we were through a lot of merger and acquisitions and we were swimming in money basically I mean the, the so it was all you know hands up in the air and <laughs> we could walk on water and computer games was extremely hot right and everybody and nobody was looking at PLs I mean we were only looking at investment coming in because in the future this would be the thing right <laughs> and then so whatever it cost to make the games didn't didn't matter so much at the time which was a, a blast I Last. remember the stories about the IU office there with uh, your own chef and oh uh, yeah yeah we <laughs> had yeah almost 24 hour service with the chefs making food for us for breakfast and lunch and dinner and yeah we were well taken care of and uh, i think it was also the year where because of the release of contracts that went well, that uh, everybody going to E3 was also going to Las Vegas and having a, a ball there. Um, <laughs> so that was, was uh, that was the times. It was a little bit different, maybe. Um, that that was different, yeah. It was fun. It was really fun. But it was also so. The reason I joined was, of course, to then bring in China, and and the thing that happens with that with that was first a lot of communication on how do you. So this whole change management of beginning to work outside the studio and the whole fear that comes with that. And, um, and then, uh, but, but, but what we really wanted to communicate and what was the truth was that instead of being able to only do one game in the studio, we wanted to be able to do more. So we wanted to be able to do more different, different games and, and thereby giving everybody in IO uh, a greater sort of creative responsibility. And we did, right? So that's when we launched in development uh, Kane and Lynch. And a year later, we launched uh, Mini Ninjas in development. So it was, oh, yeah. that was sort of the start of, of that era. Cool. And, and uh, when you joined uh, Funcom then later on, what yeah, was? the year after. So yeah. I can che cheat a bit. Oh, absolutely. That's fine. Yeah, but it's, uh, we don't have to. And we ended exactly. up being partners at Eidos because Eidos yeah. was doing Age of Conan with exactly. us at the same time, which we yes. signed in 2005. And of course, building MMOs back then. Funcom <laughs> had launched an MMO in 2001, which I launched when I was, was working on the publishing side. Um, and MMOs required all their own engines, all their own stuff, everything needed to be built. So at kind of from 2001 to we launched Age of Conan in 2008, we grew from about 100 to almost 500 people in the studio. Um, and I know you want to focus on 2004 and the Nordics, but I did a, speak, a speech two years ago where I compared the markets in 2008. Mm. And in 2008, according to the data I found, Funcom was the most successful uh, single studio in the Nordics. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's still yeah, the single that. studio in Norway of any size. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that is a, um, a problem, of course. Mm. But yeah, back in 2004, it was, as you say, harder to get investment but it was starting to improve it had been nuclear winter after the kind of dot-com fallout yeah. and there was no one who could fund anything for several years but in 2004 it started to change and from five and six and onwards absolutely so a different environment but we also had to remember that we we had already passed the kind of the movie industry because that was always the goal in the 90s when will we pass the movie industry we passed that but we still had not opened, China was not a, an active consumer market yet. That just happened in five and six and kind of mobile gaming mm. wasn't there at all. Nope. Um, yes, we had some, some women that gamed, but we didn't have a lot of women who gamed every day. Now that, that is kind of a huge, kind of 
50% of the populace, now mm. they've also active gamers. Mm. So it's a very, very different environment now yeah. than back then. Well, I remember actually from my uh, speech here, I checked it out, um, they did uh, downloadable PC games. Uh, so it was, uh, in the US at least, it was 45, 55 men, women. Um, um, uh, at, at that time as well, um, yeah. but you just play the downloadable PC games basically. Um, cool. So, uh, anyone who, who has something to share on these topics, um, was it what is better now than in 2004? What have really kind of improved uh, in, in a significant way? Is there anything you go into the office in the morning? It's like, th thank yeah. God we have this. Well, I think I think the industry is much more mature. You know, we have more more people working, we have diverse people working, and to your point, you know, uh, I think uh, nobody. Well, very few people maybe ask that if this would you go for find a new proper job instead of working in games. Yeah. So I think very few people. Uh, is, is well, very few parents are questioning that nowadays, because I think. Many people who work in the industry may earn much more than their parents are doing. <laughs> so, mm. so, uh, so I think I think that's a kind of a, kind of a one big big change. It Not doesn't help though. My father still tells me that I should. <laughs> <get a problem. laughs> when will you grow up? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's is is there something you really miss from 2004 or or, or you know, 15, 20 years ago? I felt that it was better. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I miss, uh, there's many things I miss, but that just ages me, I think. But I, I miss game stores. Yeah. Discovery oh, in a game store. Going in and seeing oh. what's there and what's new. In 2004, that had already started to disappear a bit. But if you go 10 years prior, then it was a voyage of discovery, just going into a store and seeing what they had. And I miss arcades. Mm. Actual arcades with the same thing. You go in and see, is there a new machine? Oh. How does this work? What's going on here? Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. As I, as I mentioned, it wasn't the best best of years, so <laughs> so don't don't miss miss that much, <laughs> to be honest. So um, I, I think there's one memory. It's not the actually. It's part of that part of that that maybe the one of the proudest moment, maybe weirdest moment of of our career was that 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 we were having a meeting at the Nokia. Well, Nokia was this at this height, the peak, peak Finnish game, Finnish you know, mobile manufacturer. And we were go going to negotiate uh, about that mobile, you know, engage stuff. And that didn't go well. So he, he, he started to demand weird, weird kind of uh, terms. And like, you should work only exclusively for us during this project. And that's that sort of a thing. And, and we were on the brink of the, of, of the uh, bankruptcy, basically. That if we don't get that, it's kind of a goodbye. Mm. But me and my partner, we said goodbye. Let's go and maybe we we'll look at the each other. That you know we can't can't go with these deals. But maybe it was it. it maybe this was it. But luckily, you know, a few days later, later, you know, the um, ad agency was which was running the project actually called us, and then eventually, you know, we got that deal. But, but I think there was kind of a weird moment. Okay, maybe after nine years. This was the end of Housemark. Mm. I well, don't miss that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that, that kind too. of a <laughs> feeling, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a weird memory that came to my mind. Now. But uh, <coughs> something I, I, I hear mentioning all the time is like we were smaller teams and we, mm. uh, uh, the, the old people that I've talked to here, uh, the, that is my age, kind of uh, at Mellow Yellow perhaps in the late evening, it's like complaining about it, it was better before, right? Smaller teams and so forth. But you were really pushing it with 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 the outsourcing and and having to expand as well. Yeah, yeah we heavy. pushed to to larger teams in a sense. Um, and yeah, I think this. I have to echo the the thing about professionalism. I think that you know back then there was no ed education really, right? So I think one of the big advantages mm. now is we have great schools. Mm. Game assembly being one of them here. Um, so it was it was re really a little bit of cl of Klondike back then, right? Yeah. <laughs> so all, all just uh, yeah, doing what you could and, and trying out things, and of course that can have a charm. But um, and then I think also we have to be happy that a little more game women is coming into games. Mm. Uh, back then it was pretty pretty lonely. Pretty few, uh, yeah. In Denmark, unfortunately, it still is. I think not the 
the greatest statistics of, of women in games, but um, getting better. Mm, mm. So, yeah, no, I, I guess uh, the cigars will be the only thing missed from 2004. Cigars, yeah. <laughs> more, more smoking in general, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> did, yeah, did, that's you true. did you smoke cigars in the office <laughs> in 2004? Not in the office, but okay. <laughs> in the smoking room in the office, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, th 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 does anyone have like uh, this is like the weird experience uh, from from back in the days that you remember uh, and and still still kind of shared today, or or um, uh, or have forgotten about and don't want to talk about, but you have to share now when you're on stage here. Something that I happened. think I almost did that actually. I, I kind of <laughs> did that experience that like it's uh, like a bedding, you know, just. Leaving the leaving the deal, knowing that this this could be the end of us. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's because it was unreasonable. The guy was <coughs> um, and not a pleasant guy. I think he was full of himself uh, and so forth. So it's uh, he didn't understand anything about games, of course, and, and that was kind of what they we, uh, actually that's quite weird that you know you are in this weird meeting and it turned out to be pretty disastrous in a way but, but it wasn't our fault <laughs> uh, but i think a lot of that has been true all along mm. there is very little predictability right. there is kind of yes you sit down with the finance people and they say oh so how much are you going to sell of that game mm. well <laughs> let's make some assumptions yeah but a lot of things can go wrong along the way it's kind of I think most of us have been in an environment where there's very little kind of complete security for everything going your way. It's a constant kind of yeah. being on top of things and, and adapting and, and finding new ways of doing things. We're kind of, oh, digital distribution. Suddenly we're from having about kind of one to two games per week out on a platform to about 40 games per day. Right. Yeah. Imagine that in a retail setting, running around having 40 new boxes on the shelves every day. And the, uh, the first Xbox Live Arcade games were 25 megabyte uh, uh, download, uh, max download, I like to remember. Um, I remember the, um, uh, w w we looked at, as we worked closely at DICE with uh, um, uh, Xbox, uh, we got to, to see and demo the Xbox Live Arcade stuff pretty early on. So when I left DICE in 2005 and started being an agent, I started looking at what kind of games can be out there for the 360 launch that could work as an Xbox Larry Kane thingy. And I uh, remember being at um, uh, THQ, uh, sorry, um, uh, Game Connection in Lyon in 2005 and pitching some games for this Xbox Larry Kane function that, that was, you know, to be... Uh, and, and Microsoft was promoting, but I pitched it to a couple of publishers and there was a publisher who said, like to be as I really think you should try to do something else and, uh, <laughs> uh, that doesn't sound very smart, right? Uh, it's like, dude, like just friendly, friendly warning in, in, in all, you know, very kindly so. Uh, but then at GDC 2006 uh, met the same guy and he went like, I like to have those games. Where do I sign? <laughs> you know, because then it happened so very quickly, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we... Uh, Something else uh, we talked about is, is the difference of, of uh, like E3, for example. Uh, uh, back in now, E3 is gone, right? Um, and it hasn't really been. Anyone have a, a, like an E3 memory to, to share? <laughs> Except the, the, that we're all happy that the booth babes are gone. Yeah, I guess. yeah. That was, yeah. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, yeah. That's something enhanced weird. booth babes, right? Yeah. So. <sighs> Damn, I, I probably actually at the time it's it's nothing related to related to, 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 to this E three, but driving around in a convertible, I think at the one of the few times you, you rented the car. So I refused to buy a buy a baseball cap and I drove the whole day <laughs> the, the roof open <laughs> and um, I, I think my my scalp was so red <laughs> during during pitching the games <laughs> the following day. So I was like, I think I should have bought that baseball cap, you yeah, know, yeah. earlier. <laughs> straight from Finnish winter. Yeah, to LA. Straight, straight. Yeah. yeah. So so I burned my my skin badly. And it was an amazing uh, uh, amount of money that was poured into that show, right? In a, in a different way. Yeah. But but I think kind of. 
the way Gamescom has been kind of developing, I think that has taken up a lot of that, even though there's this old nostalgia about old E3. Gamescom is a way better, more organized show. Much, much and kind of, oh, yeah. yeah, much more professional. E3 was a classic kind of get the retail buyers drunk mm. and get them to <laughs> sign big pre-orders show. Yep. That is what it was. Yep. And then it started to transition into kind of let's try to, and they never managed to really reinvent themselves. There was a little period where it was a good kind of showcase and announce place, but mm. it, w it ha still had that remnant of being a kind of, let's push some units into Walmart type feel. Yeah. Mm. So um, for for the retail, yeah. for sure. In the late '90s, E3, for example, banned online uh, publications because the f the paper publications were saying that if you bring in the online only guys, we will not cover E3 because they were feeling the threat from online uh, online journalists. Mm. That was also e th there was much quieter in the E3 halls in the '90s than it was in the mid 2000s. Yeah, uh, that's that's a that's a good reflection. Let's focus the last uh, couple of minutes on, on the future. Uh, we know now, right? Everyone uh, has a good idea of where we're at and where we'll be later tonight, <coughs> Mellow Yellow. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, the future, where are we 20 years from now? Um, can, uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, you, Christine. Oh. Do you have one or two kind of words uh, to describe that, that future 20 years from now and wh why, why would it be those words, so to say? I think it's it's very hard, right? But yeah, think, it's um, impossible. Nobody's going to be able to shake you up on this. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I think it's it's very important to look at. You were just mentioning the the new gamers, the the ladies mid year. That's me, kind of that plays games more than once a day. Yeah. These little things. Um, so definitely, I mean, looking at looking at the people who are playing is going to be very important and very and it's different people mm. and i think first thing that's going to go away in my opinion is consoles i think they're going to be dead completely because the next generation never sat in the sofa with their parents and looked at tv so the whole idea of a console on a tv and all that doesn't really make sense um so i think and i think playing together is important um i hope playing together is important because mm. I think people get lonelier and lonelier as it goes right now in the, in the next generations. Um, I, s I saw, I had the pleasure of seeing the presentation today earlier uh, on VR. I had the pleasure of working with the lady who gave the presentation as, as well last year, uh, together with Unity. And, um, and I think there is things happening in that space that's going to be really interesting to watch. And then it's going to be interesting to watch what's going to happen with engines in general, right? And, mm. and, and technology like because it's working, it's because it's ev evolving so fast. I think there might be some sprints that we haven't even imagined yet. Um. True. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, AI start opening the door to that in a way. I Hilary, any thoughts? Yeah. Well, if you if I think of uh, industry, you see the trajectory. I think the industry will be vibrant, diverse. We have. Uh, some of the best game game developers in the world, whether it's smaller titles to up to huge AAA titles, we have have it all. Whether it's PC, console, mobile, set top box, maybe in the future <laughs> VR. <laughs> uh, so so I think I think you know, this this trend's gonna continue, you know, and and we have a lot of people who, you know, we a lot of people who can you know have done well in the industry going to help the younger developers and and we kind of have of course already have the critical mass so i think uh, great great opportunities ahead and i think uh, capturing more and more market share from other <laughs> other other kind of regions but I, I do believe that you know i, I think the more i think diversity is, is one thing that of course we already produce <laughs> Lots of different kind of games, games for everybody basically, and I think that's going to continue. Yeah, and that's why the diversity in within the teams is going to be mm. important because mm. you can't make games for people you don't know. I mean, it's yeah, mm. Morten. Fully agree with the kind of two. Uh, there's two different answers. Mm. It's mm. on the in this on the Nordic region, definitely. It's mm. just getting more and more varied, vibrant, and viable in all ways. 
uh, we have so many advantages over rural regions because we're kind of the type of structure we do when we develop usually flat structures, good communication, lots of diverse teams. It is great. And then value, the value kind of structure, you know how yeah. you know the Nordic yeah. values. And lots of different creative teams coming together, solving everything from small to large games, which is fantastic. Um, I also on the on. I think games will be fully ubiquitous. No matter what device you get them on, I, I agree. Platforms will not matter as much. The games will matter. And if they become fully ubiquitous, it also means that it'll, it'll cater to a lot of different tastes, just like music and movies and TV and books does. There's lots of different tastes. Doesn't need to be the same. Just scale your kind of game and your plan correctly. Yes, if you're building for a small, if, you, if you're building the world's best ja jazz record or recording the world's best jazz record, you cannot expect to sell the same as, Tiff as, as Taylor Swift, but you can still do a fantastic jazz record and, and earn a living from that and make money from it. Good, thank you. I, I used uh, AI. To <laughs> to add my part to this, of course, because <gasps> that's the buzzword right. of today, right? Yeah. So so um, I um, I uh, for 2024, uh, 2044. Uh, I asked the uh, the AI uh, rendering, uh, rendering engine there. So, what will uh, a, a game conference with Ilari and Morten uh, look like uh, then? <laughs> and I got this back, <laughs> and I think that's pretty. Uh, you see them there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, I th it was pretty accurate. I think it's pretty it's scary. Much younger, <laughs> yeah. um, much younger, much younger. And I also asked, so how will Christine's uh, game studio look? And it looks pretty flashy, I gotta say. You see the skyline of Copenhagen in the background there. Uh, yeah, it's awesome to have screens on the floors. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, really, really exciting, I think. So with that, I um, wanna just share what I, what I wish for in 2044. Uh, I wish that we, as an industry, um, continue to meet here and uh, share and help each other uh, between our companies and as, as industry colleagues. Um, I, I hope we continue to be inclusive and focus on people's uh, capabilities, rather where they're from or, or what they do, uh, um, or what school they've gone to or they dressed or whatever. I wish we managed to continue to excite our customers, which are, they are the ones who actually makes this possible for, you know, paying for the work that we do, our products that we put out there, and uh, really, in the end, is is what you know sponsors uh, things like Nordic Game. Um, I will be myself 69 years old in 2044, but I do hope. Uh, I wish I can attend. If if I'm still able to keep a conversation going, then be sure. I will be here. Thank you so much, dear panel. Thank you, audience. A very happy 20th uh, anniversary to, to the Nordic game. Thank you all. And thank you so much for sharing your 20 years memories of Nordic game. We do we are do Jacob, now do we get going to get uh, re reduced ready for prices the for Nordic pensioners? Nordic game 2024 awards in about half an hour. So keep your uh, keep tuned and stay on the show. <laughs>